Cyprus. Hey friends, I am super delighted to have a special guest today. My friend and colleague and parent educator, Ann Brown is joining us today. Anne has been a parenting educator and consultant for over 40 years, working with individual parents, couples, and groups. She taught her first parenting class when she was still pregnant with her first child, which means she didn't really know much about raising kids at all. Uh, but over the decades, she's raised her two sons, taught classes at Merrill Hurst Early Childhood Center in Oregon City, trained as a Waldorf teacher, created parenting support groups for the Hannah Anderson Family Foundation, and has led workshops in both California and Oregon. Her favorite gig, however, was co-hosting the cable television show with me called The Motherload, in which we had um, on-camera guests to answer parenting questions, which was fabulous. Um, hi, Anne. Hey, Amy. <laughs> um, that's your kind of professional bio. What else would you like to add for listeners about who you are? Well, the first thing I want to add is when you and I met, uh, you were in one of my parenting classes and um, your daughter, who is now in college, was two years old. And I remember we went around the room, introduced ourselves, and you said, well, I'm a child psychologist. And I was like, oh, no, I have <laughs> someone who knows something in this class. And it turned out in that same class was also the woman who had founded the Early Childhood Center. She was there with her grandchild. And I remember coming home that first day, and it's like, man, I can't make things up this year. I'm going to have to really learn what, what I need to say. Um, I am, uh, yeah, I've been doing this job. My oldest son is 42, almost 42, and I, I was first hired when I was pregnant with him. I am also a cantor at our, um, at our local synagogue here. I was not raised religious. I was raised very humanist Jewish and kind of fell backwards into the job as cantor because I can sing. But through that, it has really opened up a new world for me of being able to understand who I am and what I get out of. For me, what worship is, is a bunch of people getting together, saying things of great value and importance to me and saying them in community. Mm. So it also has informed how I feel about teaching parenting and raising kids, the importance of community and what our kids get from that. Yeah. So if you're listening, Anne has graciously agreed to do two separate episodes with us on the most important medicine. This episode, we're really going to focus on an important topic, which is how do we talk to kids about war and violence that's happening in our country? If you're listening in current time, you know there's a significant incident that's happening um, you know, in um, Europe, and it's really important that we find ways to talk to children about war, about terrorism, about violence, and this is timely. We've been living through a pandemic where there's been a lot of social unrest. So Anne and I are gonna unpack some of that today for all of you. December is really themed around focusing on what's most important for the most important medicine, which is how do we as professionals who work with kids and families respond to events that are traumatic. So episode one of two parts, Anne and I are really going to dive into these hard conversations. And then we're going to circle back to all of you and talk about a more lighthearted topic around the holidays. But let us for today dive into this topic that I think so many parents, professionals, educators are grappling with, which is there's a significant incident happening um, in Israel and Palestine right now. There's a war going on. I don't want to call it a conflict because I think that that really minimizes what's going on over there. And I'm not sure that people know how to talk about things like this. And, and as you know, we're on the heels of a pandemic where there's been a lot of social upheaval. So let me just pause and ask you, as both somebody who is Jewish, as a cantor in your synagogue, as somebody who's worked with kids and families for 40 plus years, how do we even begin talking to families and kids about something so big? Well, of course, it, it, it fully depends on the age of the kids, that we would not talk to a five or six-year-old the same way we would talk to a 12-year-old. We have to understand what they can take in. I think that the first the first thing that's important to know is kids know more than we think they do. 
that I, parents say to me all the time, well, we don't keep the TV on, we don't have the news on, our kids don't know, but they do know in, in almost the worst way, which is they don't really know, but they're intuiting and they're coming to wrong conclusions about what's going on. Um, my younger son, who's in his middle 30s, told me recently that during the Iraq war, when he was little, he thought that the war was happening here in America. And I thought, I forgot to tell him. You know, like in all the things that I would say about what the war is that was appropriate for his age at five or whatever, um, he just recently said, you know, I really thought they were coming to our house. And that that made me even more, it made me even more sure that kids are always jumping to wrong conclusions if we don't tell them what's happening. So the first thing that we need to do is accept that they've heard something. With middle and grade school kids, I like starting by asking them what they know. Mm -hmm. um, because I first want to find out where are they at, say, what do you know about what's going on in Israel? Have you heard about what's going on in Palestine? Um, a lot of times kids will hear key words like hostages. Uh, and so I really want to know what they've heard and what they don't understand. And I also then want to ask them how much they want to know. Mm. I think it's really important because I believe someone who says, I don't want to know. I can't hear about it. And, and so as parents, we often are so devoted to doing this right that we almost have a lesson plan ready. Like, oh, this is how I talk to them about racism. This is how I talk to them about anti-Semitism. This is how I talk to them about war. And like any school, you know that emergent curriculum is the best. You don't really come with an already made curriculum telling them. So I say, what do you know about it? What do you wanna know? I um, love that. Let, let, me, let me pause there for our listeners. I think that really honors where a child is. Because you can do that whether they're five or 15. What do you know and what do you want to know, which honors where they might be about the topic on a given day, given other things that are happening in their own lives. So, okay, great. Then what? Right. I, you know, I use that also in my practice with uh, parents who are divorcing, where when they say, how do we have the talk? And I always say the talk needs to start with the question. There, there's a wonderful quote. I think it's Ellie Wiesel quote that says, a question possesses all the power that the solution does not possess. That it's all in asking the question, what do you know, what do you want to know? And that gives the power back to them. So um, if, they, if they would say, let's say with this, what's going on now in Palestine and Israel, well, I, I know that there's a war and I know there's fighting. And then we start by saying, you're right. You've, you've heard correctly, there is. Would you like me to tell you about it? And there are ways that I like to talk to kids about racism or anti-Semitism that I don't shy away from my values. Mm -hmm. I don't want to shove anything down their throats where they feel that they're getting dogma from me. And you know, we've, we've all talked to little kids about political stuff during presidential campaigns where you just know they're mouthing what they heard and they don't know what they're saying. Right. So I want kids to, to know, but I also want them to know that I have a point of view. And I think this is a time when parents need to do some inner work with themselves and their spouses and their, and their partners before they talk to the kids. Because Agreed. we have to know how we feel about something before we tell them how we feel about it. Uh, because the kids will ask a question that's gonna pull the rug out from under us. And we don't, we don't wanna be stuck saying something that we can't stand behind. So I would always start by saying, I'm really sad that there's a war because in a war, people get hurt and innocent people get hurt. And then we bring it down to where the child lives. So for younger kids, it's, it's talking about, you know how we always say, use your words. Sometimes people can't, even grownups can't use their words and they start fighting and that's what's called a war. And that, and, and kind of leave it at that. I, I like saying one thing, two things, and then, waiting. In fact, you might remember, Amy, from my class, I always say do 25 kegels after you say something <laughs> really important, because I think we have this need as parents or educators to keep filling in the space with more talking. So we say something like when grownups can't use their words and they start fighting, that can be called a war. And then we're like, 
So do you understand that? And in conclusion, and let me tell you again, and we just flood these kids. So I like to say one thing and then look at them, do my 25 kegels so I stop talking and I have a very toned pelvic floor at the end of it. Um, and see what they say about it. I like checking in with kids a lot saying, do you want to know more or is that enough for now? Yeah, and maybe even just clarifying, right? What have you heard so far? What are you hearing me say? Because if you've done what you propose, right, which I, I talked to my partner, I kind of checked in with myself. Then when I check in with my kid and I say, so what are you hearing from me so far? And they confirm, and that's in alignment with what I was hoping for, then we may not need to go further or we may need to go further, right? Right. I, one thing we know for sure, Amy, is that we don't know what kids are thinking mm -hmm. if, they, if they don't tell us, that they are coming up with their own conclusions. With very young children, of course, I wouldn't even talk about war unless they brought that word up. If they said, what's happening? What's the war? I think it's important to remember with young children, let's say under the age of six or seven, mm -hmm. they still live in a world of once upon a time and archetypes, yep. and they do not understand nuance. And so there is a sense of betrayal in a young child when they hear that something bad is going on in the world. That, you know, we first want to give our kids a foundation of the world is good. So then when something bad happens, that's an aberration, um, which is why it's such a heartbreak when kids are raised in situations where it's not good because they start to normalize that it's not good. That's right. Um, but if we are fortunate and privileged enough to be raising kids in a world that is generally good to them, that's a little bit easier for them to understand when things don't go right. You know, you say to a three year old, um, you can't have a cookie and you're bad. And then you say to the three year old, you can have a cookie and you're good. So for them, bad and good is very clear. And for them to already have been exposed to something very bad, even if they don't really understand what it is, we have to first readjust and recalibrate that the world is a good place for them. And so one of the things that I like saying to kids is this is something that a few people are doing, but most people don't want it to happen. And most people are working to make it not happen. That when something scary or negative is happening in a child's world, I like to show them the people who are protesting or changing it. Um, even if it's not, even if you can't, if they can't see the fruits of our labor in protest yet, to know that we do something. Um, and that so again is alignment with values, right? Like we as a family, whatever your family decides, or even if you're a professional listening, right? As a professional, this is the thing I do. This is what I teach, what I can stand by. I do think it's really important for kids to know this is what's happening and this is what we do about it. Yes, and that brings me to something that is very dear to my heart, which is I am a strong believer in family mission statements and classroom mission statements. Mm -hmm. I think that it's uh, not necessarily the product, but the process of going through, let's say, a family mission statement, uh, starting with discussions of what's important to each of us. What do we believe in? What do we want? And in classrooms, you know, I like substituting the word rules in a classroom for agreements. What are the agreements that we have? Because let's start with what do we agree on? That we want to all have a good time in the classroom. We all want to, uh, no, we don't, we all want to not have our feelings hurt. We all want to be heard. And once in families and classrooms, we can establish what we want. There's our framework for a mission statement. Then we put it into sentences. And once we have a mission statement, Let's say we're talking to our children or our classroom about current events. We have something to hang on. It's like, well, that does that go with what we talked about with listening to each other and respecting each other? I think that putting things in a large framework when it's a small thing can be very comforting. Yes. So um, can we use a really like let's use an, an example here for people who might be listening. Let's say in a classroom or in a family, the the value right, is in our family or in our classroom, we solve problems respectfully. Or in our classroom, in our family, um, we take care of each other. Right. And then so-and-so raises their hand and says, 
But my friend told me that they're not doing that and that there's kids that are being hurt. And, and, and now probably that's not something a three or four year old would ask, but it definitely could come up for a nine or 10 year old for them to say, I'm watching the news and they're not following these rules, right? They're, they're, I, I'm not seeing this happen and there's confusion. Right. And, and that's where, in addition to confusion, there's betrayal, which yeah. is how dare you tell us these children are thinking that the world is a good place when I know. And I think that even younger kids than I mean, kids hear something. I would say in the case of the war uh, on Hamas, particularly Jewish kids are hearing a lot going on and they're probably not nine years old. They're probably younger. So we have to validate first. Yes, you're right. Not everybody follows these agreements. And what can we do about that? That's bringing kids into the table. I mean, I want to hear again the power of the question to kids. So what can we do when somebody doesn't follow those agreements that that people are getting hurt and then let the kids come up with suggestions, even if they are far fetched. Mm -hmm. Because we want their voices to be heard and when i'm in a classroom I, I write down all of their suggestions, even if it's well we should build a rocket ship and we should go I mean like okay, because I want them to know that they are. They can be part of a solution as we talk about it. I don't think it's realistic to shield our kids forever from the fact that there are people who do really bad things. But I think that we can instill in them that when that happens, let's see what we can do to make it better. Let's see what we can do. A classroom could write letters to children in Palestine and children in Israel just a picture of flowers, a picture. Honestly, the parents or the teachers don't even have to send it. It's really more about letting the kids do something, a hands on something where they have contributed in some way to the thought that they're going to help other children. I if agree. Yeah. I agree. I, in the middle of the pandemic, I had a family that I was talking to and there was so much you couldn't do, right? But this little boy just started writing letters to people in nursing homes because he wanted to do something. And so he he just got a couple of pen pals and and he felt purposeful. He felt meaningful because he was writing letters to these elderly people. They were writing him back. It probably brought them so much joy and him and he couldn't control the pandemic. Right. But he could write to two people in a nursing home and really feel like he was doing something. So I love the idea of first hearing their voices and then second, really allowing them to find something that's meaningful to them, even if as an adult, we know that's not going to solve the conflict in the Middle East. Right. You know, uh, if kids are artistic leaning, you can make peace flags out of old washcloths you can you can do and hang them anywhere there is something about adding the doing to the thinking to the feeling hand heart and mind and when you put those three things together you get a full experience uh you know clinically we can say it's a kinesthetic it's this but it really i think of it as hand heart and mind where you can look at the the, the prayer flag or the peace flag or the letter you wrote or the plant you put in your garden mm -hmm. and know that that is something tangible that reminds you of doing good. How do we, I think about things, not just solely to what's happening in the Middle East, but uh, what happens in schools around violence, what happened in our country with our nation's need to address systemic racism. When kids say to us, could this happen here? Could this happen in my school, my neighborhood, my synagogue, right? Like, how do we respond to that, Anne? I think that it depends on the child and it depends on the child's ages. It's, it's really very much the same as talking about death with young children. There are some very young children, two, three, four, five, who can't handle the truth. They can't handle the truth. Mm -hmm. And I say to parents, promise them that you're not going to die until they are so old that they don't need you anymore. It's too abstract. It to you, yeah. yeah, if it happened to God forbid. Okay, we'll add that. But that we have to know who the kids are and we have to know what they can handle. Um, when a child's, let's say a child's house burns down or the neighbor's house burns down, 
what we can always do is focus on, well, now we have the phone number of uh, the firefighters nearby. Now we know we have, um, we have fire extinguishers. We tell them what we do to be a little bit more prepared if it happens. Mm -hmm. So with children who are experiencing anti-Semitism or racism or, or Islamophobia, um, and might be a little bit more aware that, yeah, that can happen. There are things happening. What we do have to say is, yeah, there are still people who are learning that hating us is, is, is ridiculous. There's nothing to hate about us. We're, we're all people. I think that we have to say that so they know that we're not lying to them. Because when they hear about it somewhere else and they will hear about it either through ambient something or, or direct, then we will lose our credibility. So we do have to say, yes, it could happen. Um, with older kids, I believe very strongly in the power of history. That if you know history, you know that things can happen, but they also come back again. There was a, a study done during 9-11. Uh, Psychologists interviewed grade school children to see who, which children were the most resilient to what had happened during 9-11. And they concluded from this study that children whose parents had taught them the family stories of ups and downs, mm -hmm. that we, we came you know, from Europe and we built ourselves up and we built a store and then we had six stores. And then one night grandma got you know, drunk and set fire to the drapes and all the stores burned down. And you know, we lived in the car for three weeks and then we started to build it up. When kids see that this is normal, they're resilient. But when all we do is talk to them about upward, 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 try and then we did it, when something happens like a pandemic or a war, they feel like, well, there's no blueprint for this. We have, we have to show kids there's a blueprint for stuff that happens. Yeah, we have ups and downs. I find that as someone with anxiety, I find that really comforting to know that this is what life is. And we all somehow have bounced back. Well, and, and the other piece I love about this, because you know I could talk about resilience forever, is you're first of all, giving them a story of overcoming adversity and that adversity will happen, right? It's not just that there'll always be a steady upright, you know, improvement, that adversity will happen, that we can overcome adversity. The other piece that is so critically important to me is that there is a safe, stable, nurturing adult who is providing that information in a safe way for that kid. That's, to me, that's really how we build resilience is through those connected moments. Well, which is why I think it's essential that before we talk to our kids, when at all possible, we do our inner work first about everything, not just trauma and, and not, but just how, how, where am I with this? Because how I present it to my child or to my classroom is going to give them all the information that my words do not give them. Absolutely. And, you know, you almost have to rehearse in the mirror. This is how I'm going to say it. This is how I'm going to answer it. And if they ask a question that knocks our socks off, then we say, that's a really big question. I'm going to put a lot of thought into that. And as soon as I come up with an answer, let's talk some more. I, this is one of my favorite lessons I learned from you in, in all the years of knowing you, which is it's okay to not know and it's okay to not have an answer right away. And it is so important when we don't to pause and just say to our kids, what a great question. Let me think about that and I'm going to get back to you. I think it respects their question. I think it honors where we're at. I mean, I can't even tell you how often I've used that, Anne, and, and you know, when something horrible happens or a question comes up that I'm like, what the, what? And I just say, you know what? That's such a great question. I really want to give you a meaningful response. Yeah, it, it also ties into this idea of go to the end of the fight first in your head, before you ever say anything out loud. So it doesn't even have to be a fight. It has to be with with something that is traumatic. It's go in your head before you answer, go to the end, which is what do I want my child to get out of this? How do I want my child to feel at the end of what I'm about to say? 
And when we do that inner work before the questions are asked or, or while they watch us process, I'm okay even processing in front of a child. Like, why, why is there war? Why do people hate people of color? Why does this happen? To say, you know, let me talk that through so I can think it through as well, because that's a really good question. What and let them see process of say, well, I suppose some of it's this, I suppose some of it's that. Their kids need to see the blueprint of how we process way more than they need to know what the product is at the end of our processing. Oh. And that's what call the end of work. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about younger kids, right? Understanding the question, making sure we ask them what they want to know. What about for our teenagers right now who are, I feel like things are so heavy. We know there's increase in anxiety and depression for teens right now. Um, and now, you know, we're talking about another war that's happening. How do we talk with teenagers about this? This is essential to be thinking about it and talking about it for parents and for teachers. When we see what's going on on college campuses, um, with the protests, that it gives us great insight into the young adult brain mm -hmm. and where, how at each stage of development, we process current events. And for older teenagers, maybe even younger teenagers um, and college age kids, in their brains and their development, this is a time of great ideals. And um, along with that, sometimes great hubris. Uh, you know, you know, kids who come home from college after one semester and they're like, well, as a social scientist, I now believe that's like, okay, you've been in college for three weeks. Um, but we need to understand that what is going on in the world, they will take in in a very different way than we do as adults. They will be drawn to the rhetoric. They will be drawn to the, um, the marching part of it. And so I think that when we talk to them, we need to really begin with how much do you know about the history of the Middle East? Mm -hmm. How much do you know? Because what they're hearing is the result. The result is, is war. Yep. What they might not know and might not even want to know, but it's our job to, to offer it to them is, do you understand what those words mean? Do you understand where this comes from? Certainly um, in Israel and Palestine, it's very important for kids to understand the history of why this is even a conflict. I mean, this is not, this didn't begin with the hostages. And I think we need to tell our kids, do you know that this did not begin with the hostages? Because many, if not most of American teenagers might not know that. Absolutely. I mean, I'm going to be honest, how many of us, you know, several weeks ago when this started, we're Googling uh, Israel-Palestine conflict, Gaza, um, land, right? How many of us as, as adults, responsible adults, we're trying to get meaningful information for our kids, for our profession, so that when these hard questions came up, we had some kind of context to provide them. Right, which runs into another issue, Amy, which is so huge, which is where are we getting our news sources? And so we could say to our to our teenagers, let's Google this. But then we get a, another fabulous conversation topic with them. Who do we Google? Yes. Do we trust CNN? Do we trust which news sources? Everything is connected. And so even to find out how should I feel about what's going on in Palestine and, and in Israel, we have to start with who should I believe? Mm -hmm. And in this world today, you know, when I was growing up, I would open the world book. There was like one thing to learn. And I'd say, OK, that's the history. But now this is a great opportunity to also say to our teens, where, let's figure out where to begin and ask what a great question to ask our teens. Who do you trust? Who are your news sources? Who do you read? Um, and then together come up with a really good balance from Al Jazeera to the, the Jerusalem Post and really know what everybody is saying and then come to their own conclusions because teenagers need to understand that there is not one easy answer to this. Mm -hmm. Little kids have no nuance. They need its archetypes. Who's good, who's bad, how do we fix it? Teenagers are able, and it's good for them, it's, it's good exercise for their brains 
to learn that there's no one right answer. So let's join the debate and let's learn about it. Um, I, I know that when I marched as a teenager in the 60s for civil rights and, and against the war, if anyone had interviewed me about what I was really marching for, oh yeah, yeah, I mean, I would have sounded like an idiot. I didn't like, oh, freedom. Uh, you know, I don't know. And so I, I have a lot of um, affection for teenagers who have a who run in, into something, but I also am aware that it gets very dangerous when they're repeating rhetoric. They're going into um, doing rather than than just thinking about it or or feeling it. And we want to make sure that they know what what they are fighting for and what they are fighting against. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then the very last part of that is, as always, we bring in our values of how we feel about it. Uh, knowing anyone who is raising teenagers or teaching teenagers knows that it's very important to them to be contrarians. <laughs> Let's just say um, a parent says, well, I am I really feel like these people are wrong and these people are right. The teenager's gonna say, well, I, you know, I think that they're, and to not freak out when that happens. You know, um, on the morning of one of my son's bar mitzvahs, he, I was saying, get your shoes on, we're late, we got it. And he goes, okay, but by the way, I don't believe in God. And it was like, is that the perfect teenage thing to say to your mother, to your Jewish mother on the morning of your bar mitzvah? And I was like, I don't care if you believe in God, put your shoes on. Um, we're getting the car, we're late. And so we have to not be bowled over when especially something like um, social unrest, issues that are so emotional for us, for what's going on in the world, what's going on in our country, we need to not be bowled over when our teenagers <laughs> a little bit, you know, and say, well, I don't believe in that. I think that we should bomb them or we should bomb the other guys to be able to take a deep breath <laughs> and say, I hear you. Tell me more about why you say that. And to say, you know, I don't see it that way and not be afraid to talk about something and defend our values yes. as long as we're not shoving them down their throats. Okay, so I've kind of written down, if and not shocking, right? You had many brilliant things to say, but I've written down 10 specific takeaway, takeaways. So I'm going to review these real quick for our listeners, and you digest it and tell me if you want to add anything or if we missed anything that's really important before we kind of wrap up this, this uh, conversation. The first thing I heard is center yourself. Do your own work as an adult, figure out what your core beliefs are, your values, what is the message you want to give these kids. And the second thing is create these value statements, whether you're a family or a classroom or a professional pediatrician, right? What are your values that you're going to put out into the world so that you can then go back, which is the third thing, and have this shared mission in our class, in our family, we believe, because then we can reflect back to that. The next thing I heard after that is hear their voices, invite conversation, encourage dialogue. And then the next thing is allow them to engage in action. And for a five-year-old, it might be, I loved your idea of like drawing flowers and pictures, making peace flags. For a 16-year-old, it might be taking part in a march or a demonstration. Um, I heard you say, do what's developmentally appropriate. What you say to a five-year-old, what they need to hear is different than a 15-year-old. And then you moved on to talking about what I call probability and possibility, right? When someone says to you, well, could that happen here? You want to be honest with them, right? Which is the next part of what you said, don't lie, right? But yeah. you want to be honest with them about the difference between what's likely and what could happen. And then go to the end, let them see you thinking out loud, process with them, pause and collect information when you need to, and then guide them towards history and knowledge, inviting conversation. And then I love that at the very end, you circled right back to and let them know what your values are. So that's pretty amazing. I, I mean, it started with ourselves and our values and ended with go back to inviting conversation and, and, and centering our values and 
not being afraid to tell kids what we believe. What, what did I miss? What did anything else we want to be sure that we're letting well, that you really got it. And, and I do, I do believe very strongly what you were able to see and what I was saying, which is you can't do anything without values. You can't do anything without a point of view. And I think that a lot of times parents in their quest to want to give their kids freedom to make their own decisions are forget that they, our kids also need to know what we believe in. And when we know what our parents believe in, even if we don't believe in the same thing, what we know is it's important to have values. Uh, one last thing for parents of younger kids and for, for teachers of younger kids is expect dramatic play to come mm -hmm. through after something goes on. So in at home or in, in a preschool or a kindergarten or second grade, you might hear kids using those words in their play, hostages, right. and to not freak. And to just go listen, say, tell me about your game, what's going on, that we cannot thwart kids from having to process how they process. Uh, and that will always be for dramatic play. I like actually putting provocations out for dramatic play if there's something going on. And what? let them alone, let them work it through. I, I agree. Put it out and just be curious about their stories. Yeah. Um, you know, I never want one person to feel like they're a spokesperson for an entire people. Would you like me to speak for all Jews of the world? I, I would like you to speak for all Jews. I, I, I think what a lot of people want to know right now is, what do I say to my Jewish friends? What do I say to my Palestinian friends? It, the same thing could be said when everything was happening. And I'm a white woman, right, during the middle of the George Floyd incident. And what do I say to my black friends, right? But what do you say to someone whose entire people are being hurt and harmed. You know, this is a huge issue within the Jewish community that we are hypersensitive to who is reaching out to us and who is not reaching out to us. And when I say hypersensitive, I'm not necessarily hyperjudgmental. I understand that it's not that present for a lot of people. But I will say that everyone, when you reached out to me, it brought tears to my eyes because you are someone who doesn't have an emotional, historical, religious connection to what's going on, but you knew that I do. And that is also something that as parents, we can encourage our kids to do and do in front of them, which is, you know, let's just send a card to our friends who are going, just saying, I'm sorry. There is no, there's almost no wrong thing to say to somebody when you reach out to them other than, I'm so sorry this is happening. I, I would say that I have more, I wouldn't say tension, but, but there's more going on bet between me with my Jewish friends who have different feelings sure. uh, you know, from left wing to right wing about what's going on. And I really got the outpouring of my friends of non-Jewish friends. I think that it's essential that in our values, we teach kids that if we have a feeling for somebody, we express it. And we don't just, I mean, we, we all have had times where people say, I didn't know what to say, so I didn't call. And I get that, but I also would like to model for my children or my students that you gotta go a little deeper once you, you can't stop there. You can't stop it, I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say something. All you need to say is, I don't know what to say, but I'm thinking of you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, and if we as adults are feeling it, then our Jewish children are feeling that as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. And don't be afraid to say it. Say, I'm sorry. I don't know if you remember this story, Anne. This is like, I don't know, probably as old as my daughter. But I was talking to you about religion. And you were, you were explaining what you explained at the very beginning of the podcast, which is that you hadn't grown up hyper religious, right? And I said, you know, I hadn't either. And I really had been struggling with the idea of, you know, a uh, a father, son, and a Holy Spirit being like three separate but equal and one of the same thing. And I said, you know, I just don't know, Anne, if it's like God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, like how could that be three and one at the same time? I think maybe there's just a lot of like incredible, you know, people that did great things. And, and you said, you might be Jewish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And fully, we're willing to embrace and love me into the faith. And so, well, you know, one of the 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 great 
words of, of Judaism that I hear all the time are, you don't have to believe in God to be Jewish, but you have to be willing to wrestle with the idea. And, you know, the word Israel, Yisrael, which means the Jewish people, is one who wrestles with God, that you don't have to have the answers, you just have to be willing to think about it and wrestle with it and not know, because that's how we find our own truth, is wrestling with something. So yeah, I mean, clearly you have that in you, <laughs> that you, you like to hear something and then really mull it over and really wrestle, which is, I would say, something we want to foster in our kids all the time is, be, that's called critical thinking, Absolutely. be a critical thinker. Yeah, yeah. So as we wrap up, I just want everybody to hear, Anne and I are encouraging all of you, invite these conversations with your children ask them what they know and what they want to know. We don't want to back away from these conversations. Um, and thank you so much for joining me and talking about this really hard topic in a really developmentally appropriate and yet compassionate way. Um, for anybody that would love to know more about you, about your synagogue, about things that are happening, where might they reach out to find more information? should have made a website <laughs> I, knew I, just, I knew i needed to do something i was going to but then my tooth cracked and i had to go I, I just couldn't take care of everything at once um i will get information to you perfect and, and, and then you can get to me through you we'll put it in the show notes then so yeah. um yes. from the bottom of my heart thank you for having hard conversations for decades with parents it really does make a huge difference in the lives of children and families so thank you well, thank you. I am honored and thrilled to be talking to you about this again. I've missed, I've really missed you. Yeah, me too. Bye.